Okay, hello. Hi. Well, thank you all for your patience. Um, good afternoon. My name is Paloma Lopez, and I'm an educator with the Indian Arts Research Center at the School for Advanced Research. First, I want to thank our hosts for this series, the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture, and Executive Director Polly Nordstrom for allowing us to share these events with you here. And thank you also to Marita Hines, Angela Crespin, Damian Anaya, and everyone else here at MIAC who worked so hard to support and promote this series. Um, I want to take a, a moment to acknowledge that we sit on Pueblo lands, the very land from which the topic of this year's speaker series comes. As we progress through this year's series, please take some time to think intentionally about where we are located and how these discussions reflect that land. And finally, I want to thank all of you for joining us here for the first event of the 2023 Native Arts Speaker Series, Grounded in Clay Conversations. This year's series is a part of the larger Grounded in Clay project, which includes a traveling exhibition, which opened here at MIAC last summer, and a company catalog, which you can check out um, at the bookstore on your way out if, you, if you'd like to, and a documentary, which is available on New Mexico PBS. Grounded in Clay, the Spirit of Pueblo Pottery was organized by the School for Advanced Research and the Vilcek Foundation and curated by the Pueblo Pottery Collective a group of more than 60 artists, writers, teachers, and community leaders from each of the 21 Pueblo tribes in the Southwest. This year's speakers are all members of the Pueblo Pottery Collective. The topics they will discuss over the next several re weeks first surfaced while planning the exhibition. The aim of this series is to afford space and time to under-examined issues and lesser-known narratives intersecting Pueblo people and pottery. Over the course of the series, our incredible speakers will explore the ways in which we communicate, the implications of climate change on Pueblo people and practices, the importance of language and the place in pottery and language and place in pottery making, and the underrepresented narratives of the Pueblo diaspora. All speaker series events take here at MIAC's O'Keefe Theater at 1 p.m. Dates for our upcoming events can be found on SAR or MIAC's event calendars. Today's event, Earth, Wind, Fire, Water, Pueblo Pottery and the Environment, features speakers Dr. Matthew Martinez. Jason Garcia, and Dr. Christina M. Castro. They will discuss deeply seated connections between Pueblo people and pottery and the environment. Martinez, Garcia, and Castro will examine the ways in which Pueblo values and beliefs pertaining to the environment are reflected in Pueblo pottery and explore the impact of climate change on Pueblo communities and practices. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers to you. Um, Dr. Matthew Martinez, Okay, Wenge. Dr. Martinez holds a PhD from the University of Minnesota in American Studies and American Indian Studies. He has served as First Lieutenant Governor of Okeawenge and was the Director of the Northern Pueblos Institute of Northern New Mexico College, where he continued researching and publishing scholarly works about Native art and culture. Currently, he is the Executive Director of the Mesa, the Mesa Prieta Petroglyph Project in Bolarde, New Mexico. Um, next, we have Jason Garcia. Jason is a potter, ceramicist, printmaker, painter, father, son, brother, uncle, and alumnus of the Universities of New Mexico and Wisconsin. His work has been exhibited in the National Museum of the American Indian, the Heard Museum, the Palm, and the Palm Springs Art Museum, and many more. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Christina M. Castro. Dr. Castro, Taos, Jemez, and Chicana, was born in Southern California to a family who participated in the Federal Indian Relocation Program. She currently resides in Ogopogo, Wingay, Santa Fe, New Mexico. She is a mother, writer, farmer, scholar, educator, community organizer, multi-dimensional artist, public speaker, and more. In 2017, Dr. Castro co-founded Three Sisters Collective, an indigenous women-centered grassroots organization devoted to art, activism, education, and community building. She is also an independent consultant with Cons Castro Consulting. Um, thank you all for being here. I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon, Sengitam and Renews. It's great to be here with, with all of you, all, all the new friends. So thank you all for, for being here. Uh, thank you to the School for Advanced Research, the Vilcek, and the Museum of Indian Arts and Culture for hosting these spaces and these conversations. So I really encourage you to, to uh, ask questions at the end or uh, intermittently as, as you see fit. Um, 
and we'll go, go ahead and get started. So, <clears throat> so this this is the map that was included in the grounded and clay publication. And so, as was mentioned, there are 60 curators that came together to really cultivate uh, this project. There was a lot of discussions about um, the format and and the content. And so, a lot of this took place over Zoom, um, over COVID during COVID time. So, Zoom really provided a safe space in many ways to connect with each other as friends and colleagues, but also with the goal of, of, uh, of including this exhibit that you can see out now in my act. And so one of the conversations we had was um, coming up with the appropriate spelling of our own tribal nations and the places that we come from and the places that we represent. Um, so this was a revised map previously used here in my act. And, um, it's a really good snapshot. So one of the one of the ideas was, you know, it's only for for us here in New Mexico and Southwest, but the exhibit will be traveling to New York. So what is translatable to East Coast sensibilities um, that would be important to convey about particular places and maps? And so I look at this map and I, I think about um, what is included and what is excluded from these particular graphics. And so. Um, no critique on, on the on the team, but obviously it's within the colonial boundaries of New Mexico. And from indigenous perspectives, we think hemispherically throughout the Americas. And those relationships are really important to define who we are as indigenous peoples. Um, and the use of Mogollon is obviously the you know a Spanish name from previous uh, governor that served, and so those that title is used to refer to those indigenous peoples and this part of the state, which is the misnomer. So there's there's these labels that get transferred over time, um, even places like Mesa Verde and, and Bandelier, which are really cold colonial names. Um, you know, the list goes on and on with, with Kit Carson and the mountains and, you know, they're, they're, they're common names that are used to refer to these spaces that do not reflect who we are as Pueblo people. And even the word Pueblo, right, is a Spanish term. Um, that um, that is often complicated. So I, I love looking at maps because it's a good way to critique visually to see what's in the map and what is excluded. And so I always like to just share that with the, with the general public about ways to think about labels and terms and colonial boundaries that have been superimposed on indigenous peoples and continue to be um, superimposed. It also makes me think about um, the Pueblo diaspora. Yeah. And um, if we, it would be really cool. I'd like to see some type of mapping. Maybe my pueblo could take the onus of that because so many folks migrated um, and moved during relocation era and boarding school too, but relocation era particularly, just to see a, like a, a visual diaspora of how, where pe pueblo people now reside mm -hmm. in the modern context. Mm -hmm. So even within our particular villages, there are neighborhoods and communities within that that have their own names and sensibilities. And the diaspora is a really important concept to that too. So. There was a time, I think, in the relocation era where they were like forming small like Laguna villages in Northern California. I don't know if any of you have heard about that. They were doing their dances and everything. I once saw, I once saw a real photograph of a Laguna colony in Marshall with all the railroad car, car, cars in a circle. So they created a village with a plaza in there. Love it. <laughs> yeah. So to elaborate on this, this further context of how we think about names and spaces and places within these particularly geographic regions, um, I one of my favorite mountain peaks, Okupin, which is a, a a southernmost direction and how we think about our Tewa boundaries, which is Jason's uh, Tewa ni Okupi. And so driving from what's so-called Santa Fe down south, you see the back of Turtle Mountain, which is a, an illustration of just really this sleeping being, so to speak, is how I interpret it. Um, but it's really a, a critical directional marker of how we think about our, our Tewa boundaries and landscapes. And so most people refer to it as Sandia, right? Which is obviously a Spanish name. It's very descriptive um, in itself. Um, up north, we refer to a place called Tzeshupi, which is 
Eagle Nose Mountain, and literally there's a description of how that beak is formed in that mountain peak. And so every mountain range, every um, particular landscape of how we think about our homeland really embodies who we are as indigenous peoples and the connections to these places. And so I, as mentioned, I did my graduate work at University of Minnesota and I was always looking for where these mountain peaks to define where I'm at in relationship to the place. And obviously the Midwest has a very different sensibility around that. And so um, I felt lost in many ways, but it became my second home. And so uh, I can go on as far as the particular peaks and valleys that have these names uh, that we refer to in our Tewa um, terms, but um, you know, obviously Tiwa, Toa, Karis, and all the other languages that include the Southwest have these descriptive names that are stories within the stories. And so um, these are one of my, my favorite places to, to come out um, down by my grandmother's house in Yunge, which is just across the bridge of, of Okiawinge. Um, and it's a really um, quiet space to, to reflect and, and be. I, I love this photo because the cattails are included in photographs. and. Uh, this was really a key practice for us as kids, collecting those and making our headpieces and headdresses that we use for ceremonies and traditions. So there's a, there's a gathering that happens in these places that connect to reverence. Um, and on the right is uh, overlooking a petrichor. And I want to read a, a quote by one of my mentors and teachers, Herman Aguayo. And he says, to us, these petroglyphs are not some remnants of long lost civilizations that have been dead for many years. They're part of our living culture. What is stored in the petroglyphs is not written in any book or to be found in any library. We need to return to them to remind us who we are and where we come from and to teach our own sons and daughters And so I, I reflect on that when I'm out in the work that I do is that these are our textbooks. These are the stories. And there's often this, this publications, these many publications that have talked about indigenous peoples without history, right? So those that haven't had a written record. But petroglyphs speak against that, right? Weavings, pottery, clay, everything has that written language and story within that. And these are visible reminders of, of where we come from. And then also Tsikomopin, uh, Tsikomopin is also up there, which is also one of our western mountains. Long way uh, on the east mountain is uh, Kusanpin, which is the uh, Sangre uh, de Cristo. So, you know, within those four, four sacred mountains within the four, within the Tewa world. So, you know, no matter what, as far as a Tewa person, along with um, Matt as well, you know, we're still within our, our boundary markers, our ancestral boundary markers. So even though, you know, like, Dr. Martinez said of going to school at um, UNM, you know, you're at home. And then when you go outside of that, four sacred mountains. And unfortunately, he went to Minnesota. And, <laughs> <laughs> and so I saw, uh, uh, I won't say the other name, I saw somebody back there with the M. But you know, there was a. Uh, so, you know, moving to Madison, Wisconsin, like Matt said, you know, you're bounded by certain geographical formations. And I was in Madison, and I was in a place called Dejo, which is four lakes. And so the, the two lakes were my boundary, and I was on the isthmus. So it's always, you're always two to certain uh, geographical points on, on your location. You know, you get lost, you just say, oh, the mountains are over here. So, you know, four the lakes this way, you can't go a mile this way, you can't go a mile that way. So um, it's always interesting just of, of how we use the landscape uh, to orient ourselves. Oh, I just want to say that we all went to college together. <laughs> so we have a very long, I used to take care of Jacob, Mason's <laughs> son, when you were like six months old. <laughs> so on that note, uh, hello, Yehu, Tenoha, um, Hamashuba, uh, um, greetings in Tiwa and Toa. I'm Hamas and Charles Pueblo. Um, this uh, 
is part of our Hamas Valley Corridor, place of my grandfather, Henry Guido. Um, I am a relocation product, product, <laughs> product of the Federal Indian Relocation and boarding schools. And my family um, uh, are from, you know, my family's Pueblo, but I grew up in Southern California. But um, I was raised by my grandparents, and they brought me home all the time with them. They raised me. Um, and I just remember being a kid and coming through the Hamas Valley that we would have, we'd have a house in, in Hamas and seeing these red rocks and just feeling like I'm in a different world. And it was a distinct, you know, the distinction that is just embedded in my um, sensory perceptions as a child. And knowing once we got to Hamas, you know, we got to be with our people and live and amongst this um, compared to Los Angeles. <laughs> Leaving that concrete was just a great feeling, the great expanse of, of Hamas. And, um, and then we would go to Taos. We usually started in Hamas, then we would go to my grandma's um, home of the Taos Pueblo, and coming into Taos, and you start to see the gorge, and you're like, wow, we're really, we're really in, another, in another world now. So these, these are um, place marks that are really um, etched in my, in my, in my DNA. And um, just remind me of who I am and where I come from, despite these impositions. So we, we could talk about the particular pieces that we selected for the exhibit, Grounded in Clay. And part of the process that uh, the School for Advanced Research did was open up the, the collections for us to, to go in and see what was available, what might we select, what we want to write about. And so there was a lot of time to just engage and just be with, with the collections. I, I wasn't really sure walking into uh, the SAR collections what I was going to select. I knew I wanted to select probably something of an animal figure. Um, my Tewa name is Tsaramutse, which is a yellow turtle. And so, yeah, I'm obviously drawn to, to Oku and, and, and Saramu and any figures and styles designed along those lines. And so I saw this, this black um, leaded turtle figure. I wasn't sure who the artist was, but I was just, you know, drawn to it because it was, quote, very, very simple and in many ways, no, no fancy designs and motifs around it. And so I picked it up and um, spent some time with it and really you know, engage in a conversation in my own personal way. And there was a story that came to me as a child when my father woke me up at the crack of dawn, um, getting me ready for Oku Shadu, which is our annual turtle dance. And you know, half asleep, getting put in line and getting mudded up with Napu Shu, these, these, these clay, these clay things that were brought and gathered for us to, to be painted in. And so that story resonated. So that's what I wrote about in my essay. And later on, I learned the artist, uh, Greg Garcia, which is uh, Jason Matt, his uncle. And so, you know, there was that connection here too. And then Jason's telling me was Oku theme. And so just, you know, again, you think about these relationships and these connections. And so it resonated for me. It was very personal in thinking about um, the work that um, your uncle did, and um, Robert um, Rob just gave me some other photographs of Greg's work that he has here too. Uh, really simple, black, polished work. And I can have these around for you all after you see too, but I want to see them in person. And so um, that's, that's kind of, so I learned more about the artist after I selected the piece, and so that was my my process, process in selecting it, and so, um, and I'm, you know, I think about how this is going to translate to, to New York and the Met, because um, it's, it's very, you know, there's a, there's a specific context here in New Mexico in the Southwest, and so, how does um, my little Oku travel to a place like the Met, right? And so, I, uh, it's a being, it's a person, right? How this is going to be? There's a question at the end. That's a Gopharidae. It's a Gopharis, Gopher tortoise. And it will translate to the East Coast, which has box turtles. <laughs> okay? Same jump shell. 
and they're terrestrial. They don't do water. They get their water from what they do. So that was my, my process in, think, in selecting the species in the first time. Just your description of your little turtle traveling mm -hmm. reminds me of Rose's uh, observation that perhaps the past chose you uh, in saying, I'd like to travel. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. The pots of agency, right? Mm -hmm. Something to that. Oh, okay. So I forgot about this one. So I was going to include a description of of the Oak oh, Shadow Turtle Dance and maybe some photos, but which not be appropriate. So I'm just going <laughs> to. So the, we, we use a turtle shell that the men use that's um, located on the back of a right leg as part of our instruments that we sing with. And so there's a sample of that. And then again, there's a connection to the petroglyphs, that long legacy of reverence for, for turtles, for, for bears, for deers, for all these tracks that have laid the foundations of how we came to be in this world. So I thought it's obviously a continuation of those sensibilities here. Another example is our, our deer dance and how that manifests. And so last month, uh, we had our annual deer dance. Well, actually after three years of COVID. So it was really amazing to see young boys and men out for the first time after three years um, to conduct this uh, ritual, this, this winter ceremony. And so this photo is from Los Luceros, which is right, right across um, Fioge, one of our ancestral sites. Um, so there's a, a herd early morning that comes out and, and drinks water, mm -hmm. and uh, you can hear them giggling early in the morning. It's, it's, it's amazing to hear the, the elk bugles down in that valley area. And so again, petroglyphs, animals, dance, it's, it's a, part, a part of our relationships of how we think about when we step into these traditional spaces. Oh, I guess it's my turn. <laughs> um, so um, that's me. Um, this is me um, kind of post um, first master's degree when I first decided as an adult to move to my Pueblo. So as I said, I was raised in LA. As a child, I lived in my Pueblos when my parents were together, but eventually they separated and my mom, um, we just set up shop in LA. But this was, um, I was probably in my mid late twenties and I wanted to come um, learn about my culture. So um, I had got my first uh, master's degree. Uh, I think that one was in creative writing from the University of Arizona. I was the only native student in the program. It kind of rattled my brain, made me uh, question whether I even wanted to write. And actually I didn't end up really pursuing it. I mean, when all of a sudden then my life has taken me in a different direction. And then this one was most recently at Cal's Pueblo um, during some doings for uh, one of my uh, relatives that passed away. Um, so it's been a long um, integration. If you don't grow up in your pueblos, there's definitely a distinction. And so um, I, it's, it's taken a lot of years to, um, to get acclimated, I guess, for lack of a better word. But it's a process. You know, re cultural reclamation is a process. So um, it's a lifelong process. Um, and just considering, you know, my grandparents two generations ago relocated away, and then now you're seeing people like myself and others moving back, which leads to the next slide. Um, my grandparents went to LA in the 50s. My grandfather retired from Lockheed Martin, military industrial complex. Um, good life, you know, I think comparatively speaking, they seem to think that, and that for that time and era, that was a good decision for them and their family. They had a beautiful home. My grandfather passed away in March of 2020 at the beginning of COVID. Um, and it was really unfortunate because we didn't get to do traditional doings for him in Los Angeles and we had to cremate him and I was tasked with bringing his ashes back to Pima's Valley, scattering him then where he um, grew up in Pima's Spring. Um, so this leads to the choices of my pots. I chose two um, pieces and um, Juanita Frawa uh, is the maker of this pot. Um, with, can we advance quickly just to talk about the family and then I'll come back to the plot. So this is my Auntie Juanita. And so unlike Cam where I went into the SAR collections just randomly, you know, looking for something that caught my eye. Uh, you can call me Pueblo-centric. I went straight to my Pueblo section. <laughs> I'm going to name this and I'm going to Dallas. And I looked at all the other ones too and the collections are very overwhelming. I actually had like almost, I cried 
in those collections mm -hmm. at SAR. I had never seen pottery held in that way in like a museum setting, temperature controlled, a beautiful room. Um, some of the pots were just huge. Every kind of, you know, from uh, traditional to contemporary to sculpture. And um, I, had a, I had an emotional experience um, looking at all the pots. But of course, I went to my fellows and lo and behold, my Auntie Juanita, um, I found her. Uh, this is her family. Um, this is my family at Hamas. Uh, my goddaughter is right there on the, on the left in the striped dress. Um, go back to the um, pot. And the interesting thing about Juanita uh, is they, that family too was also involved in the Federal Indian Relocation Program. And um, they were about the same age. Uh, Juanita and her husband were the same age as my uh, grandparents. And so all these families migrated to um, different places, uh, California specifically from my Hamas family. And um, Juanita spent many years in the city, and I looked at the pot and tried to think about what aesthetics that she brought from city, her city experience, into eventually coming back to Hamas. Uh, her children were in their teens, and um, re, uh, I guess, reviving in her own way her pottery making tradition from her family. And so when I look at this pot, I think of really clean lines, which reminds me of like elements of the city. Um, I look at the feminine. The, uh, to me, it's like I see fecundity. I see feminine. I see sensuality. I see regeneration. Obviously, corn is, in our culture is a symbol of reproductivity, regeneration, fun, fun, fecundity. And um, it was just very distinctly feminine. And it's like, if you see it in person, it's like so polished. You could just tell she spent hours and hours and hours just polishing it down to almost like, I'm thinking like chrome, like in LA, the car culture, and everything's like that shiny chrome to lowriders to sports cars. L, uh, you know, California is such a car culture. And so I'm thinking about what aspects of the city that she brought home with her from relocation and back in her Pueblo. And to this day, she's still making pottery. Her hands get a little bit, you know, they, they, she has like a, you know, so many years working with your hands, uh, develop certain uh, issues. Another family member of mine, uh, Geraldine Lujan Lucero, uh, Taos Pueblo. She is um, my grandparents' goddaughter. Um, if you advance to the next picture so we can take a look at her, that's Geraldine at the Pueblo. That's her beautiful family. So the, the interesting thing about Geraldine is same thing. Her Grandparent, her parents were in LA during relocation, the same era as my grandparents. And they decided to move back when she was about 13. They packed up from LA, it was a good time, came back, and uh, within about a month of them coming home, her mother died in a car accident. So her life was irrevocably altered, um, not only by the move, because she was you know, already um, acculturated to LA, but then the passing of her mother. And she subsequently met a fine uh, Taos man um, and uh, now has reintegrated and is living a traditional life at the Pueblo, um, makes beautiful pottery. She has a shop on the south side of the village if you ever go visit. Uh, and let's go back to the pot. Um, again, she always talks about her teen years in LA and it was like bell bottoms, the bell bottom area. <laughs> And she was like, it was up to me. I would have never left. And, you know, I'm happy with my life here, but I would have been just as happy there. And talks about the good old days and the movement and AIM and all the things that were happening in LA at that time. And then I look at this image and it's just so strong. It's just like so in its own power and it's sitting in SAR in the collections, like, you know, in this, you know, it's all encased and beautifully. And I'm just like, this woman wants to go out. <laughs> she is all decked out and flashy, like tell us women, you know, when we get dressed up for doings, it's, it's a thing, you know, uh, it's, it's very beautiful and ornate and colorful and women really take pride in, in their appearance for our doings. And um, this woman just reminds me of all the amazing aspects of Geraldine as a, uh, product, again, of the relocation program, but now back 
reintegrating herself into a village community. And that's something that I've been doing and trying to do. So I do see myself in this as well. And um, I really like how she takes the micaceous play form and has created something new and contemporary. And um, she, when I picked this and she saw it, she was like, oh my god, my work is so much better now. And I'm like, what are you talking about? This is amazing. And she's like, look at that, look at that flaw. I'm like, you don't see any flaws, trust me. But according to her, her work has vastly, you know, uh, improved. So just interesting, the thing to me, it looks beautiful and complete. And to her, she's like looking at, oh, no, no, this is like, I, I've come so far. So uh, these are the two pods I chose, distinctly feminine, distinctly feminine, you know? And um, it just reminds me of me and our journey as Pueblo people and the ways we, the places we go and the places we're going. And I was really excited to see her uh, traveling to uh, here at um, this exhibit as well as um, the Met and the, the next places it's gonna go because that's very much reminds me of the spirit of Geraldine. Mm -hmm. uh -uh. She exudes confidence. You can see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah, that's amazing. The work and the ideas behind all of it. Um, I guess in terms of my the pieces that I picked, you know, thinking about my experience at SAR, I was a 2007 Dubin fellow, and um, you know, so I had a connection with SAR School for Advanced Research, and. Um, you know, when we first started talking about Grounded in Clay exhibition, um, I was just thinking like, who, what, what should I, what should I pick? I know they said like, you can pick one to two pots, you know, um, we were required to do, I think like 500 words uh, written on the pot we chose. Um, there was a thing of being like, if you write another article, you get paid an extra. So I'm like, okay, I'm two or two pots. And this, I, I said, okay, I'm gonna go in and I'm looking for like two ideas of what I'm gonna create, or what am I gonna write about, what am I gonna think about. And like Christina being like Pueblo-centric, Pueblo-centric, <laughs> and um, you know, my background is I live and am enrolled in Capo, in Santa Clara Pueblo. I also have a paternal side from uh, Okio Wingia, San Juan Pueblo, and then also uh, my maternal site is Osoenge uh, Wingia, which is uh, Milwaukee Pueblo. Okay. And um, so uh, those were the three Pueblos that I had figured I would look at. And then when I got there, I started was more um, um, drawn to Santa Clara. And then I think I had gone maybe midpoint through of uh, of other artists had already picked what they looked at. And again, there's Santa Clara Pueblo has a traditional quote unquote classic, um, traditional Pueblo pottery, black carved, uh, the black with a polish, high oxidation reduction. Um, and there was tons of them. And, and my family makes the, the, the potter, the black pottery as well too. But uh, my work is mainly based in polychrome, which is uh, mineral pigment. So that's kind of what I decided to go with. So kind of looked at, went through the collection. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's the next, the next slide over. Uh, and I think there was another one too. So there's like these three pots that I found. And again, that polychrome, the painted, painted pigments uh, created by Layla Luther Gutierrez, who's the mother and son uh, that I'm related to on my paternal side. Uh, Layla's husband, Ivan Helio or Van, um, is my great grandmother's brother. So there was that connection the, the, on, on that side. And then the, um, this one also again polychrome with a water jar. And then the, uh, there's two uh, Avanyu water serpents that are painted on there too. And um, so I think, you know, again, like I said, wanting to have something that was polychrome, something that wasn't like your black traditional, quote unquote traditional. But, you know, that's always one of those key buzz words and things like that. And, and what does tradition even mean even to? Because uh, the polychrome actually precedes the polish uh, pottery. So in a sense, the polychrome is more, quote, tradition. So I always use the quotations, air quotes, on, on pottery as well, too. Um, so this, the, the two 
I wrote about was this one and then the other one together. So it was this one and then this one. So they both have the Avenue, the water serpent, which is a symbol icon that's used in you know our, our Pueblo ceremonies. Uh, our Buffalo dance kilts have the Avenue, the Buffalo, uh, uh, the Avenue, the water serpent. Excuse me on the on the dance kilts. And uh, so that's kind of like my own personal uh, connection to that, having you know, the Ava Yu on there. And then, you know, as we talk about earth, wind, fire, water, you know, there's the cranes and then the rain cloud, you know, the rain falling, and then the symbol of water is falling. And then this was uh, won the best of show uh, at the Santa Fe Indian Market, I believe 1963 or 65, I don't recall which year it was. So again, you know, when you think about the Met, you know, of this fine, you know, artistic institution. You know, this pot that was chosen for best to show at the uh, at the uh, Indian market is kind of going there and having that place. And Leila and Luther and Batelio, you know, are amazing, amazing artists for what they what they the work that they created and the experimentation that went into uh, the different colors of polychrome. You know, where the color comes raw out of the earth, sometimes it might be a uh, a different color when it does the chemical change of the uh, firing process. So sometimes the color may be white and it'll turn uh, brown or it'll turn uh, or yellow depending on oxide. It may just turn red. So it's it's interesting just to see all the um, elements, you know, all that combined into all of these pottery uh, pots. And then the next, the one prior, the, the water serpent uh, jar, water jar, you know, it was used to carry water, you know, maybe gathered every other day or so. And, you know, that, that's carried, you know, full of water, you know, brought back to the home, you know, a, a board or a um, uh, long neck board is placed in it, you know, drink water from there. Um, tastes amazing. Um, there's no other taste, you know, like it, you know, when you're drinking uh, that water out of the, the, that pot. Board. Um, again, you know, the cloud with lightning coming out of it, the two uh, when you uh, flying down there. And also the smoke clouds, with the fire. Um, so those are kind of the kind of, that's how I, I took it. And then the next one was just one of those, again, the, the squash, um, squash pot prior uh, was created by my neighbor, my parents' neighbor, uh, Helen Rano Shukla. And her grandson was the same age that I was, so I always used to go over to the house all the time. And, you know, we'd be playing, and her and her husband, Kenneth, would always be working on pottery. That it's like, no matter what time of the day you went, they were always working on pottery. And um, so, you know, it's just those, those memories of, of seeing them work and their work ethic, and also, you know, their own um, skill of, of creating the pot and their own artistry. And again, you know, that shape is, again, a quote-unquote classic Santa Clara form. You know, that melon here, there's probably about six or seven that were created by um, Helen Schuchla and the collection, and they were all all amazing. I couldn't pick. I wanted to, again, I wanted to pick all of them, but, you know, there's only one. So I went with this one here, which, which is an amazing pot as well, too. And again, there was uh, collections, you know, my grandparents were there, my aunt, aunt and uncle, um, both paternal and maternal side, but, um, you know, it was kind of like more what's the form that actually influences my work, and so that's kind of the way that I, I took that approach. Thank you. Can we, can we go back to the, the base part? So, kind of following up on the influencing of your work, so I, I noticed the cloud images here, of oh, those are depicted, and that's something that's very unique about your own work too, is your your projections of cloud images, right? And so can you just expand on how, I know you don't have an example of your work here. Uh, yeah, I know you, you have, you're very meticulous about your cloud images, but do these ones again? Yeah, it's just one of the mechanics of the, the cloud, you know, being this, again, <laughs> traditional Pueblo icon that you see water is very sacred to us. Um, water is a precious commodity. Um, you know, our songs have incantations of rain, snow, moisture, um, direction. So I, I usually, 
you know, a lot of my work is graphic illustrative work um, influenced by table history, pop culture, um, commercialism, you know, just kind of all observations of as a table of person living in the 21st century. And um, so sometimes a lot of my imagery might not necessarily have what's quote unquote just considered like traditional designs or elements of, of what we think of as, as as imagery on, on puzzle pieces. But I mean, there's pieces of them in the essay effort collection that you can find that's just like, you know, regarding like uh, uh, world issues and things like that. There's one that's like says, save the Maine and it's got an American flag on it. Remember the Maine. Um, and so I, I, I usually put the cloud in there just to tie that reference back to my, my own, um, what would you say, ancestral knowledge, teachings, connections to where I live, um, design elements. Again, you know, using, you know, where they show up in, in Pueblo pottery, but then work that's created by my ancestors, by my family members. And, and so it's almost become a symbol, almost in a sense, too. And also, I, a lot of my work is influenced by um, superheroes. So, you know, you see an S on your chest that's Superman. So, you know, you see that cloud that's kind of just that. <laughs> image, or you see it, and you know. Uh, so I try and put it or hide it in the work. Um, you know, just that symbol, that symbol where it always comes up. And you know, you know it, you see it. And then there's also color symbolisms, also that relate to animals, directions, um, you know, things that's coding that's for like table people or native people would see it. They go, oh, you yeah, know, you know what your coding is. You know. Or it's also a teaching tool as well, too. You know, you have a, a cloud, and you have it in the specific directions, and then you can point it to, like, your niece or your nephew, or and say, this is the collab colors. Also represents the mountains as well, too. So there's different ways of, of little coding that I put in the work as well. Okay. So I'm I guess next. <laughs> So, so this is my slide. I think we're getting close to the end of the slides. Um, so part of what SAR and the Bill Trek have done uh, this last year is issue uh, mini grants for artists and community members to come in um, and look at collections or whatever the project um, would be according to something that is tied to clay and collections, so to speak. And so this last weekend, um, I brought in uh, six committee members from Oke okay, Wingi, uh, three educators and three artists, to visit the Center for New Mexico Archaeology off 599. And then Patrick Cruz hosted the group here down collections. And besides Clarence, so some of you might know Clarence Cruz, um, and his work is also featured in Ground and Clay. Um, neither of the members had ever been to MIAC or the Center for New Mexico Archaeology, which is pretty common for a lot of our community members who don't yeah. travel up to Museum of Hill and just this bubble, right? It's really an isolated, privileged bubble. And so there's a lot of hard conversations about what it means to access our, our own histories. Uh, it's very emotional, just like how Christina mentioned visiting the vault at SCR, but you know, Clarence and Kelsey and Maxine, who's our librarian, were really up close and personal with some of the pots and naming them and who they're connected to, who's founding history. So the, the storytelling was amazing within our little group here. And what would it be like to have several visits from community members up here and sharing that space? And really being a lot of private time to, to think and reflect on that. You know, at the Center for New Mexico Archaeology, there's obviously archaeological artifacts, arrowheads, uh, grinding stones. <coughs> so one of our other members here, uh, Peter Garcia Jr., is a, one of our clan leaders. And so there was a conversation and relationship there of acknowledgement that you don't often see in exhibits and publications and tour groups, et cetera. So it's, there's, there's what we call these tiered knowledge of understandings and tiered access. And so it's really um, 
emotional to just be a part of that. And I would love to continue that work here at Mayak or CNMA or any other collections where we have our histories and our, our, our places where um, where these stories thrive and continue to thrive. We just obviously, the quote that I read from Herman and Goya is they're just not some remnants, right? That there's a life and breath to them. And so it's an important step to acknowledge these connections do that. And so um, I hope to, to continue that. Um, part of it is, you know, and I'll say this generally is that uh, my and Department of Cultural Affairs is the present mission fee for Native to come in to see their own collections and visit, right? And so um, when I, my previous life, when I was uh, work, when I worked here, uh, one of the proposals was to craft free admission for Native people to come in and see the museum and didn't receive, really receive a lot of support. Um, well, children do get them free, veterans get them free, uh, foster children get them free, so why not introduce people whose collections are based on here? Obviously, the state of New Mexico makes a profit off indigenous people and culture. Um, but, so, where, where, like, so where's the traction there? Again, part of the work that we do here is to build allies and alliances along strategic ways to think about doing the right thing when it comes to stewardship. And so sometimes it's you know, hard conversations to have with that, and state systems are not the easiest and most conducive to these conversations. And so I, you know, Christine, I'm sure has some thoughts about, you know, systems and how that, um, yeah, how, how that can apply to our own, you know, community members who, you know, not only these members, but our own school children. I know there's, you know, Maria's doing a great job with school visits, but what else? Like, who's not including these visits and these conversations? Well, I always come back to the fact that um, this town, the economic backbone of this town is indigenous culture, and that's what brings tourists here. And so I'm always looking at um, how um, we as Native people here, um, there's a, it's like a, a block of liminality in Ovapogie here, where uh, if you're not performing for that artistic, touristic, Gay, they're involved in that in some way, then you know you're kind of on the fringes. Um, so I feel uh, living here, it just feels kind of extractive sometimes. Um, one of the things my board works on is the removal of the racist monuments in this town. Um, those of you from here know about Plaza 2020, and just people say that uh, racist monument came down, and then we also have the Kit Carson Obelisk that stands in front of the federal building by the post office downtown. And um, so, you, you know, you still have these systems at play um, and people have been asking for things like these monuments to come down um, in the city. Again, that everything are economically in the city revolves around indigeneity. So I think there's some um, inequity. And um, I think that as indigenous people that live specifically in Santa Fe proper, um, it's uh, unsettling at times to live here and to see all the ways our culture gets consumed, but yet we still um, have to fight for our humanity um, and our visibility outside of the prescribed, you know, native in regalia or as an artist. You know. I'm, I'm a social activist, so um, that's kind of where my book falls into. Um, but yeah, do you want to add to that in any way? I mean, how many travel members from, from Hapo we have been out to see the collections and visiting? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, I can't say that there's, there's, there's a lot. I can't say that every, every travel member has seen it, but I know from my own personal and professional experience, you know, um, there's quite a bit of people that have seen it. Um, artists, uh, museum professionals, academics. I think also one of the things is uh, Mr. Uh, Tony Chavarria also has been pretty good about um, getting access to the collections and um, then also the whole museum, whole cultural center as well too. I think that's also been one of those benefits too. Um, I'm here pretty often, so I mean, you know it's one of those weird things that where you say like, oh, there's people that don't go here, but yeah. also as an artist, that's part of my practice of you know going to 
museums, reading, researching, um, you know, working with other museums, um, other institutions. So, um, yeah, it's just one of those, it's the artistic pra practice of how you do that. So, um, and then also encouraging others to do it as well, too. So, like you said, I'll, I'll bring in others that you may or may not know have ever been there. So, and it, it's great, you know, when you have a connection with people. You know, of, of tribal leaders and cultural leaders, and, and seeing items that they may or may not be aware of, whether it's a relatives or with a pueblo, or you know, again, it is just one of those things of um, um, seeing what's on the list and saying, like, bring out everything that's at the fire. And you know, most of the times, we'll do it. So, so again, thanks, Maya. Yeah, so it's the same thing with Clarence. When Clarence does an artist, practicing artist, that visited the collection, so there's, there's definitely that relationship. Mm -hmm. Right. Are we hearing nothing? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two ten. You've got twenty minutes. Two. Well, there's Q and A. Yeah, yeah I, got, I encourage you all to open up yeah. for questions and answers. Jacob, I want to give you some time. Be, there's an exhibit tonight, right? That's opening at the Old Museum. Should we plug it? Yeah, so stand up. Yes. <laughs> well, hi, everybody. Uh, my dad. <laughs> <laughs> I changed your diaper. Yeah. <laughs> uh, my dad Jacob. Uh, Jason Garcia. Uh, my name is Jacob Shea. I'm the Cole, uh Marketing Manager for Cole Cultural Center. So we're having two exhibits going on tonight. We're having. Equinox, it's a two-person exhibit by Cree Lawrence and Pope Blocky. So it's our first exhibit, so that's exciting. That goes on tonight at 5 to 7 p.m. Also, we have a uh, big pot project that we've been working on for the past year featuring six Tewa artists. Uh, that is Pearl Talachi, Randy Silva, um, Wesley B. Hill, Sean Tfua, Clarence Cruz, and Eric Fender. So that's going to be... We're dealing this afternoon, also at 5 to 7. So if you all are free, come by this evening. We are located in Milwaukee Pueblo, 78 Cities of Gold Road. Uh, find us on Facebook. You can search us on Google. And uh, yeah, hopefully we'll see some of you or all of you there tonight. Ho is P-O-E-H. Yeah, P-O-E-H. OK, we have a question over there. Yeah, there are, I believe, some. Uh, I know they have, like, oh, I know the museum, New Mexico Museum, Museum of New Mexico has, like, a traveling museum truck. And I know this is pre-COVID that they traveled out to, like, the public day schools. So, you know, they were showing some of the things. I know the education director and prior education directors here at Maya have had, like, uh, public day schools coming in and visiting the collections and then exhibitions. Uh, I know we're post-COVID post uh, world now, so I think things are starting to open up a lot more, so I think they're making uh, plans to have uh, programs. And then there's a call on the uh, Old Museum does some stuff for the Boys and Girls Club as well, Milwaukee Pueblo. Um, I think Okio Wingate does some things for the school. Yeah, but most tribes have some sort of summer reading program that they incorporate a lot of these activities in, uh, which, which is good. It's good to see that um, continuing again post-COVID. post, post -COVID. Part of it is that um, every New Mexico student is required to take a New Mexico history class as part of the graduation requirements. So what is being taught about indigenous peoples and that curriculum that they're required to take? And so not only for indigenous peoples, but you know, Hispanos and, and diversity of the state, you know, what is included in that curriculum um, from public voices and public people writing that. And that's, that's severely lacking. And so um, there's obviously a big push to incorporate that, but there's just not a lot of curriculum in K-12 that is built into these standards that every student is required to take. I've been in charter schools, like tend to fall a lot within the state standards, but there's a lot more flexibility than two. And so, uh, you know, textbooks, textbooks adoption, I mean, which is big business, right, for those of you who work in education. 
Um, again, there's not a lot of materials to choose from in K-12 from indigenous perspectives, including in our so There's so much work to be done in that area, too. Yeah, so I, part of the work is, is obviously, you know, preparing it for, for traveling out to, to Burnett and it's going to travel to Houston after that, I believe, and there's a couple of other places, but I'm excited personally because we have a lot of Pueblo relatives that live in New York, and so it'll be a welcome space for them too, so how do we connect with, you know, our urban brothers and sisters in New York? Uh, one of my big I mean, AC Aguayo and others that are out there in New York, and so there's ways to build those relationships and I hope are part of the opening exhibit. I personally haven't been to New York, so I'm excited. Wow. 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 So you've been to Minneapolis. I haven't been to New York. Look at your tour guide. Oh there's I have two tour guides in here. Yes. We'll get your number. We'll get your number. I I love sins. <laughs> what, no, I didn't what, have one and then I think the impact is going to be great. I think they'll love it. I think, I think New Yorkers will eat up the show. <laughs> well, I, 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 you know, I just saw something about the Met. Um, I don't know if y'all saw about that uh, indigenous, or it's, it's, you're nodding your head. Um, I'm not sure what their culture was, but they were in the Met and they were trying to engage with some of their, uh, uh, some of their traditional deities or pieces yeah. that were in the, encased in the Met, and they were singing or doing traditions that they would do. Do you want to speak on that? And they were dancing. She was doing a prayer, and she was actually removed and asked to leave the museum. Exactly. So um, just kind of thinking about that, and then thinking about the just the exhibit, you know, I, I think the whole museum thing can get a little muddy. Um, that doesn't make me feel good necessarily, but our pots, I mean, they're going, they're going to be there. So I think it's an opportunity for a global audience to see how um, excellent indigenous people are. Um, I'm always talking about indigenous excellence and how mainstream culture is, is still is, you know, that deficit model around indigenous people. Um, continues and so I'm always thinking about the ways that which how we're excellent but that the dominant society doesn't necessarily recognize it so they don't know how to acknowledge ex excellences that we have but I think having this exhibit open to maybe a global audience um, maybe will shift some of the ways that people think about indigenous people think about us um, I don't know. I don't know about Americans. <laughs> I don't know what to say about America right now. Um, but I think hopefully it opens up uh, perceptions about who we are and what we're capable of and what we create. Because again, that that deficit deficit model or paradigm that is pervasive towards indigenous peoples and humanization. This is all very real, and so. Um, it's complicated. So we are working very closely with Patricia Madapine Norby, who is the curator at the Met that is facilitating these processes there. And so, you know, she's indigenous and, you know, she was, you know, given a lot of attention because she was the first indigenous person at the Met, right? And so it's, it's hiring to think about firsts, right? It's, it's amazing to think about that, but it's about time, right? Yeah. Um, but why is there only one, right, at the Met? And so she's been really good about facilitating these processes um, in a way that's, that's you know, listening to, to the voices. So she's come up several times to help facilitate. But I do know that the Met, I believe, um, I, I don't know if the Vilcek or with SAR are going to hire uh, an indigenous Pueblo, um, uh, somebody to guide folks through the exhibit. So that's like a year contract for the duration of the time that that exhibit's gonna be up. They are gonna have somebody, a community representative to to, um, to tour people and whatnot. So that's a good thing too, because I think- what, What's in the exhibit and how large is it? And the, the ground in clay, so it, I think it's gonna be close to an equal split of the pieces between the net 
the bell check, but just a few blocks away from each other. This corner right here, stand on. How many pieces are in the exhibit? Does anybody know on that? I mean, it's, it's pretty significant. Yeah. At least 80. Yeah, 100 from SAR. Yes. Will it go any place after New York? Yes. Houston. It will be in Houston, right? You have the village. Houston, 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 Hou
Minnesota? <laughs> South Lake, Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. South Lake, Minnesota. Yeah. Yeah. Viking country. Yeah. 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 Maria, did you have? Yes, good afternoon. My name is Marina Heinz. I'm the Director of Education here at MIAC. I am from Tetsugi Owinge, from Jisuki Pueblo. And I want to thank you all for coming here this afternoon. I want to thank our panelists, Matthew, Christina, and Jason. I want to thank SAR for hosting it. Well, we hosted it, but they put it together. And thank you again for coming this afternoon. Thank you so much.